Hello, everybody, and welcome to Decred in Depth. I'm Dustin Lefebvre, Marketing Lead. I'm Jake Yochampayat, the uh, project lead for Decred. Yeah. Thanks for being here again, Jake. And thank you in the audience for joining us today. Today, we have a pretty special Decred in Depth that focuses on privacy, Decred's new privacy implementation. It's been out just a, a couple of weeks now. Uh, we've generated a lot of content on privacy, and if you're looking for it, you can follow Decred Project at Twitter. You can go to decred.org, check out a lot of blogs and writing. There's also some additional stuff on Medium. Um, and Jake's been running around the United States of late talking about it all over the place. Yeah, so I've been, uh, I've done uh, two talks, or actually three talks recently in Northern and Southern California uh, about privacy and about how it works. And it's been, uh, you know, it's been nice. We've gotten some good feedback from the uh, San Francisco and, and Southern California, Santa Monica in, specific, in, in particular, uh, 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 cryptocurrency communities. And it's been, uh, it's been a pretty engaging process. So I've been, you know, standing up and giving talks about this but we had figured that it would be nice to give the uh, you know the Decred community an opportunity to uh, hear hear about it from from the developer who wrote pretty much all this code himself, uh, uh, Josh Rickmar, uh, the uh, lead for the DCR Wallet repository. That's right. So uh, because we have Josh on the show today, we're going to really focus our discussion around why privacy matters. Uh, we'll talk about getting to Coin Shuffle to Shuffle and the original Tumblebit implementation. Um, just to sort of level set, we'll do a brief overview of the implementation, and then we'll just let Jake and Jayrick primarily just dive into the details and the next steps. So, Jayrick, thank you so much for joining us today. Why don't you introduce yourself? You're welcome. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, so I'm Jayrick or Josh Rickmar. It's my full name. Um, as was said, I'm the project lead, for, or not project lead. I'm the main dev on VCR Wallet, um, and yeah, I pretty much wrote all of the code that's being used for the Coin Shuffle++ Plus Plus implementation. Yep. And how long have you been working on Decred? Um, since launch, because I was, I was working with uh, Company Zero um, before them as well, uh, before Decred launched. Um, and then uh, from I went from BDC Wallet to the CR Wallet as my like main project. Oh, wow. Wow, wow. So you've yeah. been around the space for some time. Well, thanks, yeah. for, thanks for joining us. Uh, let's just start out with why privacy matters. And I'm just going to read a little bit from the Constitution of Decred, which I know sounds a little silly, but Decred has such strong core principles. And, and I found that everything that comes out of Decred really flows from these principles. And so I, I think there's a lot in the Constitution on privacy. I just want to read it, and then I'll ask you to unpack it. All right, Jarek? Sure. All right. Incremental privacy and security are priorities and should be balanced with the complexity of their implementations. Additional privacy and security technology shall be implemented on a continuing and incremental basis, both proactively and in, de and in response to attacks. So there, there's a lot there. Why, why is privacy important to Decred? So uh, privacy is important because uh, um, it provide it's it's a necessary uh, requirement for uh, fungibility, um, so the ability to transact without uh, any kind of permissions. Yeah, I mean, uh, one way I view <laughs> privacy is that privacy, even if we if we take a step back from say this transactional and you know store of value uh, context, privacy is about preventing people from knowing what you're doing currently. Because it can affect how you know how people treat you in the future. Just like Jayrick was pointing out with the fungibility, if people know you know where all of your coins are, they could go. You know what? I don't like Jake, or I don't like you know Dustin, or I don't like Jayrick, and you know uh, make those coins unspendable or refuse to accept them because they came from us. So this idea of people knowing what you're doing in the past or in the present allows them to either outmaneuver you or uh, take countermeasures against you in the future. And that's, you know, that's a, that's a dangerous thing, uh, you know, despite the fact that our modern, our modern world uh, operates on that basis currently. Sure. So can you talk a little bit about uh, a lot of these fiat on-ramps are requiring AML KYC. Um, and, and when AML KYC is sort of paired with the pseudonymity that you get on a blockchain. What, is the, what are the sort of implications and dangers around that? 
So with the pseudo anonymity, if uh, you don't start with a completely anonymous identity, um, you're going to not gain that anonymous identity um, unless you use like some privacy technique to uh, obfuscate exactly where the coins came from. Yeah, and I mean, in terms of linking, right, you know, if there's a, a directed graph of coins in the past and then you take some of those coins and deposit them in an exchange, that exchange can then go, not only do I know where these coins came from, I know how much money this person likely had, I know, I don't know, where they went to get their groceries and all kinds of things about them that, that you probably wouldn't want people to know. Sure, so these exchanges now have all this information, uh, their security comes into question, and then the question also becomes who with whom are they sharing this information, right? And I think when you lack control over that, you lack, cons you lack control over your own security and privacy. Yeah, and, and again, it's, you know, it extends beyond just this store of value context. People can then outmaneuver you. If they, know, if they know you shop at, I don't know, Jewel or you know, Whole Foods or something, people can go, okay, well, I know that so-and-so shops there. I can go ambush them in the parking lot or you know, do, you know, do questionable things like, I don't know, put a bomb on their car or something awful like that. So these, you know, where you are and what you're doing and you know, how people infer this information really does matter. Yeah. It's also more fair, right, to, to, to ask that people not assume you're a criminal and, and you know, sort of put the onus on them to prove that you're a criminal before they have to track and trace every single thing that you do with your wallet. <laughs> Personal opinion. Um, well, let's, let, let's start talking about the, the implementation and the development because privacy was originally part of the roadmap January 2017. Uh, fast forward, we're, we're well into 2019. It's been two and a half years. Uh, when did things start and, and how did they go? Uh, so work originally started on um, the, uh, the Tumblebit implementation. Um, I, I don't remember the exact timeline of what date that started on. Um, that was uh, late 2017, like December, don't, November, okay. December of 2017. Mm -hmm. And then, it, and then it, you know, it stopped in like April of 2018. Yeah. Can you give us a quick overview of Tumblebit? And why it was yeah, chosen so back in the day? Yeah, so Tumblebit, um, it's more akin to uh, like a traditional mixer where you uh, send coins to the mixer. Um, it shuffles them all around and then you get coins back out. Um, and it works with a, uh, a particular single denomination of coin. Uh, mm -hmm. So like, let's say one DCR exactly. Um, and that, that's gonna, that would eventually cause problems for how we wanted to use it and why we chose Coin Shuffle Plus Plus. But um, it's, it's, it generally works like that. Um, there's protections put in place so that uh, the, the mixer cannot steal funds, unlike some other mixers that have been seen um, like many years before. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, it's, it works generally like that. I mean, so, something that you know that I saw as a as a major shortcoming of Tumblebit was um, how it responded to denial of service attacks. That is, that um, an an attacker can go to the the order of operations. There is is that you basically request a payout. The uh, the mixer takes you know hot coins, locks them into that 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 future payout. Then the person who's you know sending the input into the mixer has to send the input into the mixer, and then it gets unlocked and pushed along to that output. But if you request say a hundred bogus payouts, then those funds all get locked by the mixer, and then you don't necessarily need to submit an initial pay-in. So then you can lock up the oh. funds that were used by the mixer. So yeah. so that you know that th that was a pretty facile and straightforward denial of service vector uh, and you know that uh, both gave both JRIC and I pause when we you know when we had a closer look at it. Was that discovered after development started? We were aware of it but it wasn't clear how bad it was until you really got into the okay well how do we prevent this it's like well you need to implement this whole other system to you know to prevent that so. And was Tumblebit fully developed at that point? Yes. It was. Okay. And, and you guys have released Tumblebit, is that right? Mm -hmm. yep. yep. The code's public on GitHub right now. Okay. Can that be use, of use to someone, or uh, do you see the same sort of shortcomings for, for other projects or implementations? Uh, it could possibly be of use. I, I don't know. Someone might find it useful. Okay. 
I thought that there were, you know, there were a couple components of it that were interesting, despite the fact that, you know, they had denial of service problems. I want to say there was like a puzzle solver protocol, and um, I can't remember the other one. There's two protocols in it, and the two protocols are sort of um, academically novel. So who knows? Maybe they could be modified slightly and improved. Sure. It's hard. It's hard to say. We just figured we get the code out there because, you know, hey, we paid to have it written. Sure. Well, that's great. It's a public public good, and we appreciate it. Um, so talk about. Uh, how you got to Coin Shuffle, shuffle, coin shuffle Plus Plus um, from the time that you decided, okay, this, this tumble bit isn't going to work, um, back to the drawing board. What were some of the, the you know, considerations that you made, implementations that you looked at? So Coin Shuffle Plus Plus is uh, unique. When we discovered it, we were quite happy with what we saw in it um, for a variety of reasons. One is that it's extremely simple, um, and that shows in the implementation as well. It's quite short. Um, but also, it, uh, it's designed as a peer-to-peer -peer protocol primarily, and so there's, uh, there's no required central server. We, we use one for practical reasons, but um, the protocol is peer-to-peer -peer at its core. Um, and this means that uh, the protocol is, uh, there, you, you never send coins or like lock them in a hash or an HDLC. Um, <clears throat> And the the nomination can be anything that all the peers agree on. And uh, for something that's constantly changing, like our ticket price, that works out quite well. So, can you give us a brief overview of the implementation? How does Coin Shuffle Plus Plus work? Okay. Uh, do you want um, when you when you say implementation? Do you mean like how it works? Uh, in ours, or how it's described in the paper, because we we change it slightly by adding the central server. Yeah. So tell us about Decred. Okay. So uh, in our implementation, um, we have a Coin Shuffle Plus Plus client built into the wallet. Uh, it contacts a server, and uh, that what what you initially send to the server is uh, a bunch of inputs that you want to mix, a change output, how many mixed outputs you want to submit. And then the server will collect all of these together from peers all connecting at uh, within an epoch, within uh, like 20 minutes or so on mainnet right now. Um, and then when that epoch is hit, it will take all of the compatible mixes and then perform the mixing protocol on there to produce a coin join transaction. Um, and in that coin join, all of the mixed outputs produced by dice mix are uh, anonymous, or you, you, you publish them anonymously within that set, um, and uh, all of the submitted inputs and the change outputs are not anonymous. And, you know, and, uh, you know, in, in addition to that is there, there are denominations, which Jarek mentioned earlier, so that there's uh, a ticket level denomination, and then there's, uh, I think, eight other denominations below that, so that these mixes occur within denominations, so that there will be a mix on the ticket denomination, and then each of those lower denominations where there's enough uh, parties to you know to mix, mm -hmm. so that the anonymization of these outputs is based on the denomination. And uh, I just figured that that's sort of an, an important point to, to to lay out, so that even the, you know let's pretend there's a hundred of these outputs being created. The hundred aren't all totally indistinguishable, but each of the sub the subsets of that hundred at each denomination are. Right. Um, so tell us about, we, we hear simple primitives are being used to the layman. What, what does that mean? Um, it doesn't require a whole lot of, uh, it, I mean, what do I want to say? The, the paper that describes this uh, is quite short. Um, it does require going through a bunch of, maybe a few other papers to see how the math fits together, but um, it uses quite simple primitives in general. Um, you have uh, it requires a key exchange. It requires uh, like a secure sum, um, polynomial factorization, and then a dining cryptographer's network. Um, and these are all pretty well understood ideas. Um, and you can just combine them together to uh, reserve anonymous slots in a dining cryptographer's network, and then anonymously publish these messages within that group. 
Yeah, and and I mean, just like Jarek is pointing out, each one of these each one of these primitives is very well understood in, in old established cryptography or old established mathematics. You know, some of the papers that this is based on are from the 80s, and in, in fact, I believe the bulk of it is from the 80s. So, so, so that if you looked at you know a, a lot of the other privacy tech out there, it uses relatively novel mathematics that's from the 90s or the zeros or even the you know the more recently the tens, and. In our case, it's just really it's a bunch of old c components glued together in a novel way, and that was that was that was uh, you know both for myself and Jayrick and everyone we had look at this was a big draw. Sure. So you, are you saying that these have been stress tested? These 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 tactics and so on. Bad word, but they are well. They're well known. Um, they should be easy to audit. Okay. Tell us a little bit about the code because we we hear you know zk snarks is tens of thousands of lines and um, you know, other implementations involve thousands of lines. But this requires just hundreds of lines to really make the magic happen. Um, can you kind of bring us into there and tell us about it? Uh, yeah, so the, um, there's, there's, a, there's a Go package uh, called VCNet. It implements basically all these primitives that we need. Um, and uh, that's only about couple hundred lines of code, maybe like 300, 400, I, if I think I remember correctly. Um, there, there's more code in the repo as well uh, <clears throat> for uh, just like the communication, um, because this is a, it's a stateful protocol. So uh, at any given point, you're in one of these states, uh, depending on like, are you performing a key exchange? Are you performing a slot reservation? Are you performing the Dyna Cryptographer's network? And so um, there's both client and server code to uh, perform these different steps in sequence. Um, but the, the actual, a lot of math that happens is uh, quite small. And so what, is, what does that mean when you have fewer lines of codes? Are there benefits to that? Generally less bugs, easier to audit. Sure. Yeah. I mean, right? So there's a there there's a positive and a, there's positive paths and hot paths and negative paths. The to, the total amount of code in the positive path here is really quite small, and that means that let's pretend I'm an adversary and I'm trying to break the de, you know the decred privacy implementation. I really don't have that much to work with in terms of breaking it or you know or or outright wrecking it. And so the simplicity on the code front leads to you know. You know, better security overall, which you'd figure would be a you know a something people care about in the context of privacy, because you don't want somebody to be able to come in and you know kick your privacy over and go like, well, what now? Sure. So this this implementation is opt-in. You know, right now you need to run your own node, or um, you need to use it for for non-ticket transactions. Is that correct? Now a lot of people would say. Um, if it's opt-in, that's not true privacy. Can you tell us a little bit? I mean, I know going back to the Constitution, incremental. Um, you know, is is it? Why 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 was this started as an opt-in process? I, I would say that uh, we made this opt-in because uh, it's something that we can provide um, to people running. They can be run today. It is being used today. Um, had it not been opt-in. That would have required a lot of uh, more consensus changes, and we would not have been able to uh, put that out as quickly. Um, yeah, uh, obviously, I, I would I would like a non-opt-in system, <coughs> but uh, there's there's a lot more complexity that you add if you require that. You have to you need consensus changes, etc. I mean, another thing to consider here is failure modes too, right? Anytime you deploy new technology, there's a you know there's a high probability that you've missed something. There's you know there's some bug lurking or an exploit that's uh, you know that's waiting to be run. And by making it opt in, we have the luxury of going okay. You know, we're not going to create a systemic failure mode if there is something wrong with the implementation. Right. So that it's, uh, you know, it, we dip a toe in, and I feel like a lot of other projects, because of the fact that they can't change consensus rules the same way we can, mm -hmm. are incentivized to just go, well, bang, here's your whole system, or, you know, drop these huge chunks of stuff. Whereas we just don't need to do that. We can, we can fade it in a piece at a time, and, the, you know, 
because we have that luxury, there was really no reason to try to ram it through as a consensus change. Now, there are certain changes that, you know, I'm sure you'll get into and Jayrick will discuss with you about, you know, that are consensus changes, but we figured that uh, obfuscating the ownership or, you know, the ownership of coins was important and we could do it without a consensus change, so why not? Sure, and, and that gets into the, you know, I guess, coin holder sovereignty. Right. If you're going to change the consensus rules, it you know really needs to be voted upon. This was able to be done r right away without an official you know consensus rule vote. Um, well, Jared, you had mentioned the use of a single server before. Can you kind of explain? Um, you said it, it could be peer to peer, but we we're using a single server. Can you explain that? Yeah. So the uh, the Coin Shuffle Plus Plus implementation described by uh, the paper um, by uh, Ruffing um, and other names I don't recall but uh, it, it describes a peer-to-peer -peer protocol um, there's no centralization at all um, uh, we, we are still using that same core protocol but we are using a central server as a communication point um, as well as uh, an optimized polynomial factorization solver uh, which will improve mixed times um, as uh, this this improves the simplicity of the overall system a little bit um, because uh, because the protocol runs through different states, um, and if a you need to be able to uh, time out a peer if they don't send a message within a particular uh, like duration, so that you can exclude them and then move on to the next state. Um, that process becomes a lot more complicated if every peer is on a different timer. Um, and so when you have a central server and they are the only party that's advancing the protocol when timeouts occur, that greatly simplifies it. Um, it also means that uh, peers don't have to uh, punch holes into their firewall so that they can get more inbound connections from other peers and such. Um, you just make a single outbound connection to a server. Yeah, the, the UDP hole punching that Jayrick just mentioned. I mean, uh, Jayrick's actually communicating over Skype right now, which I believe uses a UDP hole punching. So uh, UDP hole punching is, is a technical mess. That's why a lot of technology you end up seeing is implemented as clients and servers, whereas you know you, you likely could implement it as straight up peer-to-peer. -peer. But the problem is, is because of network address trans translation, just like Jarek was pointing out, you have to end up punching all these uh, you know, portholes through, uh, you know, through firewalls. And it adds a lot of complexity on the uh, networking side to any, uh, to any software that, that doesn't use a client-server model for that exact reason. Sure. Um, so on, on the server model, you know, in the blog, it says that it might be iterated to maybe a mixed net or even integrated directly into DCRD. We can talk about that later. Um, but in its current state, can you talk a little bit about the, you know, how the server might handle a denial of a service attack? Yeah. So um, the. So the, the, the original protocol described by the, the CoinShuffle++ Plus Plus paper, it is also resilient to uh, peers trying to disturb the mix. Um, so there is a blame assignment process that occurs if uh, any peer sounds the alarm and says, hey, this is not correct. Um, and peers will then uh, reveal secrets which de-anonymize the mix um, so that the mix can re be replayed in public and uh, the misbehaving peers can be removed. And then you generate new fresh addresses and start over with them gone. Huh. And so the, the, the server is uh, performing that same process. It replays the mix, uh, removes the misbehaving peers, and so that all of the uh, peers who are playing by the rules can uh, still mix properly. Very interesting. Um, now, you're, you're you're the lead dev on DCR Wallet. Can you tell us uh, how the wallets need to be handled as we transition into privacy to ensure privacy? Yeah, so um, there's there's a lot of uh, ways you could shoot yourself in the foot if you uh, are not using your accounts properly in uh, DCR Wallet with uh, mixing. Um, the big no-no that you have to follow, that you, you must never do is um, Use a use a, a change from a previous mix and uh, other uh, on, uh, other non anonymous outputs together, submitting them both in this in a, into a new mix uh, because that will correlate uh, 
the two mixes together. Um, so there, we have a bunch of instructions at cspp.decred.org, um, which go over uh, how to properly set up the command line and wallet with the different accounts. Um, there'll be a whole bunch of different accounts there that you've never seen before. You just have to create them. Uh, but they're just there for the proper separation of the different uh, kinds of outputs. Yeah, and I mean, just just generically, the, the, the thing you don't want to do is that you have mixed outputs and unmixed outputs. You need to be very careful to segregate your mixed outputs from your unmixed outputs. If you start combining them per, J, per, per what Jarek just said, then you end up bleeding a lot of privacy. So, so this process of isolating and uh, you know, sort of uh, preventing these these two uh, pools of of coins from mixing is it, initially it's a you know it's a somewhat brittle process, and and we did that by design because we wanted to get something out the door. So, so rather than focus on making it super smooth, there are a number of knobs that have to be set in order sure. to properly implement privacy. So when when this gets integrated into a, a GUI into Crediton. Are, are you still going to need to use multiple accounts when you start up privacy? Uh, multiple accounts will still need to be used or some other way to segregate these outputs. Um, we will hopefully improve the, the user experience and not require so much complexity on the user's part. But uh, behind the scenes, something similar is going to st still happen. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the idea would be to do what we, you know, to take the process that's described on the cspp.decred.org, you know, website that we have up, but make it either semi or, or as close to fully automated as possible so that people don't need to be manually creating accounts and moving, you know, uh, moving you know, extended pub keys around and, and all of that. That is that as much as, as much of that as possible would be you click a button and go, I would like privacy, and then it goes and it does all of these things. Yeah. You, you just mentioned pub keys. Jarek, do you want to talk about importing and exporting the pub keys? Yeah, so um, if you're using a, a multiple wallet setup, and you want to uh, move funds from one wallet to the other uh, through the mixer, um, one way to do that is to export a uh, extended pub key from the, uh, the new mixed wallet, import it into the, um, the unmixed wallet, and then you can set that as your mix account. And it will derive addresses from that account, and the funds will end up at the, uh, the new mixed wallet. Okay. Yeah, so it acts as a way to sort of transition or to migrate funds from wallet A to wallet B, in particular ticket buying wallet A to ticket buying wallet B. Right. So you, you've got a whole bunch of different accounts now. You've got uh, mixed, unmixed, uh, you've got change to worry about, purchase, and voting. Can, can you kind of dive into some of the details on those? Yeah, so uh, mix account is where you're deriving uh, addresses for the uh, the dice mix. Um, unmixed is for your uh, the change that uh, you're producing for the uh, mm -hmm. for the mixes. Because um, remember, the the change in a, a dice mix and the coin join is uh, not anonymized. You you just send that in the clear to the server, and so that's that's put in its own unmixed account. Um, the purchase account is just. Uh, the account that the ticket buyer will be using to buy tickets from, um, and uh, depending on uh, that, that can either be a uh, an unmixed account, not a different unmixed account, mm -hmm. or it can be uh, on your mixed wallet. It can be your mixed account. Um, so it depends uh, which which use case of the wallet you're using there. Um, voting account is. Uh, that's an, that's an XPUB that you would import. You would export it from your voting wallet, import it into uh, your ticket buyer, and then you would derive uh, addresses, uh, unique addresses for each ticket um, for the ticket buyer to then vote on. Why don't we dive into that? Can you just give us the current description of how VSPs work and, and why that's currently incongruous with decrypt privacy, and then what the idea is to iterate to next to make it work? Sure thing. So uh, with a VSP, the current process is that you sign up for an account on the VSP, um, and then you create a uh, a one of two multi-sig address, um, so that either your wallet or the VSP's wallet is given the opportunity to uh, vote or revoke a ticket. Um, 
And that same address is used for all of the, your tickets that you uh, buy for that VSP. Um, this does not work with privacy because it involves a lot of address reuse. Um, so this will require a lot of changes to how uh, the VSPs are used. I think the game plan is to is to cut over, right, VSPs work on an account-based system right now. So you'd sign up and be like, I'm Johnny Mnemonic at Gmail, I want you to vote my tickets. And then you would get a single one of two uh, multi-sig key, like J. Rick was mentioning, and then that would be associated with that particular account. Right. So if we want to uh, really make these tickets anonymous, uh, we have to <laughs> get rid of the fixed one of two multi-sig account, and then we also have to get rid of this notion of accounts at the VSPs themselves. Sure. Because if you have the account at the VSP, you can be like, well, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go to this VSP and be like, figure out who, you know, who each one of these tickets belongs to, right? Sure. So you need privacy not just from everyone else on the network, but also from the VSP. And then there's, there, there's, there, there, there's, more, there's more to that, right, J-Rick? Yeah, there's more. Um, obviously, you need to still pay the VSP fees, and that has to then be done out of band somehow. And those um, vary by VSP. They do. Uh, and it's important that it's out of band for that very reason, because uh, if you put the fee in the ticket, that changes the, the price uh, that you need to use for the mix. And then you're in a different anonymity set. Yeah, it makes it, it makes it so it's possible to partition the set across VSPs. So, for example, if three VSPs have one, two, and three percent fees, you can then just trivially look on chain, look at how the you know look at how the uh, subsidy works for each one of those tickets, and then go, all of these tickets are from pool one, all of these tickets are from pool two, and all of these tickets are from pool three. And if you couple that with these accounts, you somebody goes, I want to know who controls these tickets. They go to the VSP that has you know that that has a particular fee, and boom, right. they can figure out who you know who controls those tickets. Right. So so the current setup is just fundamentally uh, not going to work with it. So what changes need to be made to uh, to enable VSP users, people who don't run full nodes, to uh, to use privacy? So correction there. Um, you can you can run you can run a full node and still want to use a VSP. Mm -hmm. uh, the VSP just runs a voting wallet on your behalf. Which okay. which does require a full node, but you can still run your own full node. Right? Um, so anyways your question was uh, like what we have to change about the VSP? Yes, yeah. How can we change the VSP to enable people who use them to use privacy as well? So uh, at its core, we're going to we're planning on changing it so that you submit a private key to the VSP. Um, this is after all sorts of other various authentication, um, uh, like on a per, per account or per ticket authentication. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess that there's three sets of changes. One is you got to get rid of the addresses. Right. So the first one is you got to get rid of this one of two multi-sig, and that requires having a separate key per you know voting uh, voting address per ticket. Mm -hmm. Um, then you have to get rid of the accounts on the you know on the, on the uh, VSPs themselves, so that instead of it becoming an account-based service, it needs to be a ticket-based service, so that individual tickets mm -hmm. you know ha can have their voting preferences set and then the votes cast on their behalf. And then the third one that Jarek already mentioned is out-of-band payment, mm -hmm. because if you roll the fee into the you know into the ticket, then you can partition the anonymity set based on who, which you know what fees are set on what tickets. So those are, those are three pretty decent sized changes, and that's probably several months of work, and you know, uh, uh, done very carefully with uh, you know the stake pool repository. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I mentioned integration to Crediton multiple times already, uh, but how much work is required to to actually get that done? When could we expect that? Don't know. I know. That's not a decred question. <laughs> when privacy? When privacy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, you know, when verb. You know, you always you always wonder how these things are <laughs> how these things are going to happen. Getting yeah. uh, getting integration into Decrediton is, is is a chunk of work. It's hard to know exactly when these things will pop out pop out. But I'd say you know several months. But how many months? It's you know it's always a dice roll. Sure. So we we have an initial implementation. Um, to to create an anonymity within an epoch, um, I know that there has been some discussions about methods to uh, obfuscate uh, transaction amounts. Um, can you tell us about that? What the what the possibilities are, and what the next steps would be? 
Yeah, so there's uh, existing research uh, done in Bitcoin um, for uh, what's called confidential transactions. Um, and that does hide uh, the transaction amounts. Um, we are looking at possibly a variation on that to um, not perfectly hide the amounts, but instead uh, blind them so that if you're able to uh, um, like reverse the operation and uh, you would be able to see the amounts in the clear, but you would not be able to just forge coins out of nowhere. Mm. Um, because we we cannot allow inflation to occur on the network. Yeah. yeah, I mean, stealth inflation, you know, while stealth inflation could occur, say, on Monero or Grin or Beam, uh, that would damage their projects, but it wouldn't be, you know, like a crushing blow. In the context of Decred, I believe it would basically be, it would be, it would be a critical blow to the system if that were to occur, because our whole system is based on this, you know, proof of stake governance layer. So if people can forge coins, then they can take over the governance layer and do whatever they want with the project. And I think that would pretty much violate, you know, that would that would severely mismanage everyone's expectations to the point that I think a lot of people would exit the project. So I don't even think we can we can't even really play around with that. Mm -hmm. So I heard that it's auditable, but it obfuscates transaction amounts. How how do both of those go hand in hand? I have a I have a I have a decent quick explanation. So Jarek was getting into the range proofs. So there's two components to this: is there's commitments and range proofs. Commitments allow you to uh, you know, commitments exploit this thing called a, there's a homomorphic property where what you can do is is if I have let's say Dustin and I have numbers A and B, and then we wanna we we wanna make sure that we can add these numbers together and then get two output numbers that add to the same thing. Mm -hmm. You can use these things called commitments to obfuscate the amounts in, in question, right? You can, you can uh, make a commitment to A, I make a commitment to B, then we can both make commitments to C and D, and then we can show that the commitment to A plus the commitment to B equals the commitment to C plus the commitment to D. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the fact that you can add these commitments and, uh, you know, and have the, the amounts that you're committing to add that allows you to to create a effectively what amounts to a commitment to zero, right? That the inputs minus the fee minus the output equals zero. So you can verify these commitments, you know, it, add to zero. It's an aggregation look. Exactly. Yeah. And then further, in order to prevent stealth inflation, you need to be able to show that, for example, that A is greater than zero and less than some big number, and then the same thing goes for B. Otherwise, like let's say, you know, there's A plus B equals 10. What we could do is, let's say A and B are six and four. We could also make it so A is 16 and B is minus six. And so we need to make sure that these values lie in a certain range or else I can start screwing with what I'm, you know, with what I'm committing to. And, and that's where the range proofs come in. So the combination of these two things allows you to obfuscate the amounts, but it comes, you know, it comes at a cost, which is that you have to make consensus changes to make it, make it happen. Yeah. Can you tell us about consensus changes, Jay Ray? Because I've, I've, I've heard that a lot of, a lot of times, what kind of consensus changes need to be made to support that feature? Uh, a lot. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't. I don't even want to think about that. That's a lot of work. Well, um, I mean, transaction amounts would have to be. Uh, we'd have to allow them to be commitments, and then uh, yeah. there we would have to. We would have to allow the attaching of range proofs to uh, you know two transactions. And um, uh, what else? I think those are the two major things. But that's but just those changes are pretty substantial. That's that's a substantial uh, change of the tr of the transaction format. So that is you know that's kind of a that's notable. And sure. just like Jarek pointed out, that's a non-trivial amount of work. Yeah, super interesting. Is there anything we missed, guys? Anything you want to add? Mm, in terms of in terms of commitments, is the commitment system that's that's implemented in Monero, Grin, and Beam is one that uses uh, Peterson commitments, which is what was originally proposed by Greg Maxwell when he proposed confidential transactions. Mm -hmm. There is a, and as Derek pointed out, that is a uh, perfectly hiding and computationally binding, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, commitment scheme. If we wanted to make it perfectly binding and computationally hiding. Uh, we would have to change the commitment scheme. So we'd have to, and the way that this, that's been proposed to do this is, is that instead of having a single commitment, you actually have two commitments, and then the two commitments act to constrain 
the solutions to the you know to the commitments being used. So it's it's sort of like if you have a two dimensional surface and you want to constrain it to a one dimensional you know slice of that surface, you take a constraint that gives you a two dimensional surface and you add another one dimensional constraint to slice that surface. And so that's really that's really what's being proposed. I know that might maybe, that's a little out of scope for most cryptocurrency discussions. You know, slicing and subspaces and constraints. But that's that's what that's what's being. Proposed. That's that's why we're here on the deep dive, right? Yeah. Talk about the we're, stuff. We're that, here to uh, we're here to draw a line on the surface. Yeah. Um, Jay, Rick, thank you so much. Uh, really enjoyed the discussion. L learning more. I'm sure I did pick up half of it, but. Uh, uh, there, there's a lot going on. It's a wonderful initial implementation and lots more exciting stuff to look forward to. Um, thank you for coming on the show, Jake. Thanks for being here with us. Yeah. Until next time.